Hi again, everybody, and welcome to Lecture 9. Now, the next two lectures, 9 and 10, they'll be serving two different purposes. On the one hand, they will be uh, getting you ready for your final grammar quiz, right? And I should mention now that the final grammar, qu grammar quiz will include both information from Lecture 9 and 10, as well as Lecture 3, I believe it was, so, in other words, anything we talked about with grammar could be included on the final uh, grammar quiz. Now, the second aspect, though, would be to give you a lot of pointers on basically your writing skills, right, for your final take home. So, keep everything, like everything we talk about today, make notes and try to make notes about things that maybe you, you think you've been told before. Like, maybe you, you tend to do this and watch out for that or whatever. So, as I said, like, like we're going to do quite a few things in, in lectures 9 and 10. And some will apply, some may not. Okay, you'll see what I mean. And so, um, in the uh, notes that I gave you, it says we're going to be doing uh, chapters eight to ten of the uh, Canadian Practical Stylist. Well, obviously, you don't have to worry about buying that, but uh, that's where I've taken much of the information. Okay. Other than that, I think I think we're good to go. So let's begin today then with a simple sentence. All right. This is especially true if any of you. If any of you watching right now, if English is not your first language, watch out for this, okay? Because languages work in very different ways, different patterns. If, uh, let's just say French is your, your first language, well then, French works very differently in terms of, uh, of, of, of modification, of uh, where subjects are found in sentences, right? As opposed to English, right? So, take a look at the very first thing that we have there, right? The simple sentence. Subject and verbs. Now, this is something that I'm going to give you two or three really good little hints for your own writing as we go through this, all right? Keep the action at the beginning of your sentences. What do we mean by that? Quite often, we will, we will back into the action of a sentence. And so you want to be careful of that. John hit the baseball. T take, take a look at the example that I have here. John hit the baseball. We have our subject, our verb, and our object. I'm not going like, to, I won't quiz you on those things specifically, all right? I won't, I won't give you a sentence and say, well, underline the subject. Remember in high school, I think I remember doing that, underline the verb with two lines or whatever. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But you want to be aware of where subjects and verbs go in sentences, how they work. So remember a long time ago, lecture three, I said, watch out for words like having. Remember I said that? Watch out for words like having at the beginning of your sentence, Okay. So that's what, because again the word was gerund if you don't if you don't remember that's where we get into trouble when it comes to subject verb agreement. So you you start with a word like having, then all of a sudden you'll have your verb somewhere down the road in the sentence, but it doesn't necessarily match up to the thing that you want it to match up to. So as I said, watch out for that. Okay, subject and verbs keep the action at the beginning of your sentences. That'll also. Uh, solve issues when it comes to fragments, when it comes to comma splices. Everything works together, if you remember. All the stuff that we've talked about, okay? So, so yes, John hit the baseball. John is the subject. What did John do? Hit. So, the action is at the beginning. Now, that may not be always true, but for the most part, you want it to be true, okay? When I say it may not always be true, sometimes you may have a passive sentence, and I've talked about that as well, where maybe you begin a sentence with because or although or while. Isn't it funny how the same words keep popping up over and over again? In fact, in our daily usage of language, there's really only about 2,000 words that we actually use, right? For the most part. Uh, and there's something called the registry, the language registry, but but basically it suggests, yeah, there's about 2,000 words. And we all we all know them, we all use them, but it's it's how we use them. That's where effective writing comes into consideration. All right, how how we use those things. So again, we keep going back to what did I say? The very first thing, one of the very first things I said in this course, 10 things, 15 things that we need to fix. And once we fix those, for the most part, yeah, our writing is fine. But it's the same 10 or 15 things over and over again. So here we go. So now we're gonna get a bit complicated, all right? In writing, we have what are known as compound and complex sentences, okay? You, you really should have your notes in front of you while you're watching this, okay? So we have compound, and then we have complex. Now, the compound is very straightforward, and your favorite word to use when it comes to a compound sentence is the word and. Compounding things simply means you're adding on to, right? Everything is working along the same line. 
And so take a look at your notes then. The compound sentence, right? Okay, coordinates. Don't get too worried about, like don't get intimidated by the language I'm about to use. If you coordinate, it simply means everything goes together. That's all, that's all. If you coordinated your outfit, right, today, like whatever you're wearing, it just means, yeah, you you put things together to match, or to work together. I shouldn't say to match, but to work together. That's all that means, okay? So it treats everything on the same level. So think, like I said, think of a word like and, where everything simply adds on to, right? All on the same level, okay? <laughs> all right. So the compound then links one idea after the other. That's that's the idea there. So look at my example. And in fact, this is exactly the way you used to speak when you were a child. This is this is how children learn language. All right. We had ice cream and we had cake and we you know played games and whatever. Right. That's the way. If you have younger brothers or sisters, siblings, whatever, nephews, nieces, um, it, it, you'll you'll notice that's the way they talk. If you ask them about their day, right. And so that that's a compound sentence. That's a simplistic, it's a simple sentence, Sim, simple coordinating, everything works together, okay? Now, it's the complex sentence, that's where we begin to get into trouble, okay? So, take a look to begin with at, at the language that we have, then I'll give you some examples, I'll, I'll give you some phrases to watch out for. The complex sentence hooks lesser clauses, remember we started with that a long time ago, like words, right, just words, onto the main sentence or the main idea, okay? So you'll have words like that, which, who, okay? But again, I'm gonna give you a couple of very specific examples. Or one of what is what is known as many subordinating connectives. Although, because, where, when, after, if. Don't worry about that, okay? When I show you the example, you'll get exactly what I mean. Now, coordinating, everything works together. Subordinating, all that means is if I am your subordinate, I am underneath you, right? In, in the order of things, I am underneath you or below you or whatever, okay? That's all that means. So in a subordinating clause, right? Or in, in, like in a complex sentence, which has subordinating clauses, all that means is, is it, it's nowhere near as difficult as it sounds. It simply means that things are not necessarily working on all the same level, okay? I didn't, that was terrible grammar, but you follow what I'm saying, right? Things are working on different levels. So take a look quickly at the um, example that I have, all right? We had a great time, although, so the minute you have a word like although, right? All of a sudden we're working on two, the sentence is simply working on two different levels. That's all that means, right? And so it's a subordinating clause. Now, as we get more, so I'll finish the sentence, we had a great time, comma, although some found fault with the decorations. So all I'm suggesting there is there are times where if, if as we get more sophisticated in our writing, we obviously don't want to use the word and over and over and over again, right? And like, like we want to shift, we want to move around. And so we want to get more, as the term suggests, complex, right? <laughs> I almost came through the computer there, didn't I? Anyway, and so think about that in your writing then. But as I said, there are some phrases, I'm sure it's going to come up, it is going to come up in either lecture nine today or in lecture 10, but watch out for phrases like as well as. Seriously, make a note of that phrase. If you tend to use the phrase as well as, that's a phrase that can get you into quite a bit of trouble when it comes to subject verb agreement, all right? And so I'm, I'm giving you a hint there. I will come back to that later on, okay? Like it will be in either this lecture, I can't remember. Um, as a matter of fact, it is in this lecture. So I'm gonna get into that in just a second. So watch out for phrases like that, all right? As well as, or words like including, okay? In addition to. Those types of phrases can really get us into trouble when it comes to our subject verb agreement, okay? As you'll see, here we go. Now, before we get into that though, uh, I also wanted to talk just a bit about modifying. Again, modifying works differently in English than it does in many other languages. So let's just quickly, I, I, I'm not gonna take too long on this, but let's take a look at something called dangling modifiers and misplaced modifiers, all right? These are words or clauses, remember, group of words, where it is unclear which element of the sentence they are modifying. It's unclear, like you, you think you're referring to one thing, but in fact, you're re referring to something else. So again, I mentioned that earlier, but now you have the language that I'm gonna show you. A dangling modifier, that's a word or a clause that modifies a word not clearly stated in the sentence, okay? Or involves a word or words which are missing in the sentence. 
That happens quite a bit, actually, where we, we are missing a word, and so therefore we think we're modifying one thing when in fact we're not. And so a clear modifier describes, clarifies, or gives more detail about a concept. And it's funny, with the definitions that I give you, sometimes the definitions themselves can be vague, but when I give you the examples, all of a sudden you think, oh, okay, now I get it. So let's just take a quick look, all right? Problematic modifications. Now, again, this is lecture three. It's probably lecture one as well, right? Where I, off the top of my head, I was just doing a few things. Problematic modifications often have an ing word. Okay, sorry, I'm boring the heck out of you now, right? A gerund. Remember, having, giving, taking, whatever, whatever, ing words. You don't want to start sentences with ing words unless they're the subject of the sentence. So, how do we fix these things, okay? Well, first of all, name the appropriate or logical order of a uh, doer, logical, sorry, name the appropriate or logical doer of the action, okay, as the subject of the main clause. Get the subjects at the beginning of your sentences. Don't back into, okay, any kind of phrasing. And that, that's a, it, it, it's a simple thing to fix, but it's a hard habit to break, okay? Literally, if you're used to writing that way, it's a hard habit to break. But I'm telling you, there's so many, so many things that can happen when we start phrases with ing words, all right? So watch out for those things. So here we go. Having arrived late for practice, a written excuse was needed. But we highlight that. Put a big star beside it. Horrible, horrible grammar. You got into trouble because, okay, the minute you use the word having, well, the question becomes, well, what arrived late for practice? Who arrived late for practice? What? So that's what I mean by modification, okay? And going back to what we just said about a gangling modifier, you're missing a word or two, right? And so let's fix it, all right? Having a right, arrived late for practice, the captain of the team needed a written excuse. Okay, so that's a bit better. So what I'm trying to show you there is, yeah, you can do it. You can start with an ing word at the beginning of the sentence if you know how to fix it or if you know really how to put it all together. But why not just do this instead, right? The captain of the of, of the team needed a written excuse because, okay, they were late for practice. Simple. So what's the difference? Well, in the first example, we have having, okay? We think that having is the subject, but it's not, right? In, in the better revised version, well, we have the captain of the team. Boom. Immediately, right? Immediately, there's the subject. So... Always think about that in your writing, okay? As I said, this is th this lecture is, is not only for your grammar quiz, right? But it's also for your final take home. So think about that. Think about having subjects at the beginning. Don't back into phrases. Don't back into the meaning of the sentence. Start with the action. And as I said, especially if English is not your first language, that is something you really want to be aware of, okay? All right. And so, and yeah, I don't know how many times I have to say it. The best way to avoid these problems, never begin a sentence with an ing word unless it's the subject of the sentence. Simple as that, right? Right. Okay. I should mention, by the way, I think the lecture today is going to go about 40 minutes, maybe 45. And so here's my perfect example. I, I, I think I did this one off the top of my head a long, a long time ago, right? We're weeks into the course now. Having trouble sleeping. Yeah, remember we talked about that one? The TV helps me get through the night. So again, you see, you think that you've modified correctly, but you haven't. Instead, having trouble sleeping, the TV, well, the minute you write it that way, it's the TV that is having trouble sleeping. And obviously, that's not what you meant. So as I said, like, like, it's such a simple thing to fix, okay? Get rid of those ing words at the beginning of your sentences. Simple as that. Simple as that, okay? And so it's a dangling modifier. It, it appears to modify the subject. But in fact, it's the TV, as I said, that's having trouble sleeping. So as, instead, uh, like, why not write it this way? When I have trouble sleeping, so notice what we did there, right? Now, when I have trouble sleeping, so the I is at the beginning of the sentence, that's the subject. Simple, 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 okay? Right. Now, the other aspect of modification, this, this one is a bit more obvious. But it's something you do want to be aware of. It's no, something known as a misplaced modifier, where you have a word in the sentence and you think you're modifying one thing, but in fact, you're modifying something else. Okay, so let's slow down just a second. So for a dangling modifier, 
most often you're actually missing words. There's, you need more words in the sentence to actually make things clear. With a misplaced modifier, it simply means you've got the words in there, but maybe they're in the wrong place. So let's just do this one really quickly, okay? I only had enough money for the show. Only I had enough money for the show. I had enough money for the only show. So all I did was I, I, I simply put only in different places, okay? And to show you the different meaning. The first one, okay? Once I paid for the show, I didn't have any more money. The second one, I was the only one of our group that had money for the show. The third one, okay? There was only one show. I know, I know. It, it, subtle, simple, whatever. But these are the things that we tend to find in first year writing, right? That you just you just put the word in the wrong place, right? And so you, you, you basically modified the wrong thing. So again, just be aware of that, okay? Just be aware of that. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to show you some funny ones here, right? I hope you, I hope you enjoy this next part. Like, just sit back and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just chat. Oh, oh, balloons. Anyway. So I'll just show you, these are actual newspaper headlines that I have found over the years. Uh, not from not not from mainstream newspapers, but uh, like local newspapers. Uh, for those of you who maybe live in, well, if you know the Ottawa area, there there are newspapers like the Kitchissippi Times and like smaller newspapers. And uh, quite often, I, I enjoy reading them because you, you find headlines that uh, their modification is all wrong. Okay, so let's just do some some quick ones. Students find this funny in class. Like you can relax a bit and just look at what I'm doing here. Include your children when baking cookies. Now, <laughs> you, you know what the, the author intended there, right? But what's actually being said? If you, if you actually take a look at, like, word for word, with modification, what they're saying is the children should be part of the ingredients. So, so that's the kind of stuff. It, it, it's, it, you know, it's not major, right, when it comes to your papers, but it's enough to, to point out, right, look, you're not, you're not doing what you think you're doing, all right? Okay. Drunks get nine months in violin case. No? Okay. Anyway, so literally the drunks are going to have to spend nine months in a violin case. But obviously that's not what was going on. Okay. Number three and four are my favorites. Prostitutes appeal to Pope. No? All right. Obviously what's going on here is that prostitutes made an appeal to the Pope. Okay. But what's actually being said in that in that head headline is the Pope thinks, hmm, those are prostitutes. They they look uh, pretty good, okay? <laughs> right? That, that's what's being said. And then finally, my favorite, pandemating fails, okay? Veterinarian takes over. <laughs> I won't explain that one. I hope you're laughing. I hope you're laughing at that one. Okay. Uh, number five, yeah. Clinton wins budget. More lies ahead. So uh, it, that back in the in the in the uh, God, I don't even remember now. It would have been the 80s, 90s, whatever, when uh, Bill Clinton was president of the United States. Obviously, uh, he 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 may may have made a, a a few a few questionable statements about sex and a young woman named Monica Lewinsky. Those of you look it up, you'll know. But anyway, so so you can read more lies ahead. You can read that in two different ways, right? I did not have sexual relations with that woman. <laughs> look it up. Look it up. Anyway, but that was a pretty good Clinton uh, impression, by the way. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Anyway, all right. Now, number six. Uh, okay, I better wait. You're laughing right now. I better wait, okay? Three, two, one. Here we go. So number six. Here's a perfect example, a perfect example of, of modification problems. Miners refuse to work after death. Now, we know, reading between the lines, you can figure out what that means, right? Obviously, there was a death at the mine. Okay, you're still laughing from number five, aren't you? Okay, anyway, so miners refuse to work after death. Obviously, there was a death at, at the mine that we were speaking about, right? And so the miners are saying, well, until we fix these problems with safety, we're not going back to work. But that's not what's being said. Take a look. What's actually being said is, once I'm dead, I'm never working in this mine again. So that, and that's the kind of thing we see quite a bit with, uh, with modification, okay? I did not have sex with... <laughs> 
sexual relations, okay? Anyway, and then here's a really interesting one in number seven, okay? This, the, the, the use of the word by, by, by. Stolen painting found by tree. So again, you see, we understand exactly what, what is being said there, that the, the painting was, was sitting by the tree, but that's not what's being said. What's being said is that the, the tree walked around and then finally found the painting. So, and, and obviously that's not what you mean. So that's what I mean. And there's a couple of phrases like that, that we're going to get into in lecture nine and 10. There's the was by, okay, of by, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see, where, where, you, you, where basically you're, you're, you're backing into what it is you want to say, okay? And then finally, yeah, two sisters reunited after 18 years in checkout counter. So we, we know what they mean by that. But literally, literally, what that means is that the two sisters stood in the checkout counter for 18 years and then all of a sudden recognized each other. OK, see, 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 see how all of this works. So, as I said, there's, there's certain things you want to be aware of when it comes to your own writing, making sure that you're actually referring to the proper thing. OK, or making sure that you have the words in your sentences that refer to whatever it is you're referring to. That's the idea. OK, my goodness, we're 20 minutes into it already. That went by quickly. All right. So now let's flip to page four, okay? Parallel construction. Now, if you're wondering, it sounds like I'm doing a mishmash of a whole lot of things here. As I said, I'm simply giving you a summary of, of uh, chapters eight to 10 from the Canadian Practical Stylist, all right? Eight to 10, I believe. Yeah, all right. So uh, here's something now. I'm, I'm reminding you of something we talked about, boy, I think, I think it was lecture seven, maybe lecture eight. I can't remember, but you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. P parallel construction, okay? What is parallel construction? If you remember, I gave an example when we were looking at the introduction. And I said, sometimes it's, not sometimes, but when you're setting up your sections, it's good to be consistent in how you express them, right? So let's take a look here. The woman was confident, intelligent, and knew how to express herself. Remember the example I was giving you before? It was, it was kind of similar to, to the one I'm giving you now, right? The woman was confident, intelligent, and knew how to express herself. See how all of a sudden, like the, the first two are very clear, and then the third one doesn't, doesn't mesh with the, second, the other two, right? So that's what we mean by parallel construction. You want to be consistent, especially in your introduction, when it comes to how you're laying out your material. So instead... The woman was confident, intelligent, and articulate. Now, remember the example I gave had to do with censorship. So you don't necessarily have to just have one word each time, but you want to be consistent. If you have one word for one, then try and be consistent, have one word for the other areas of your paper, right? But you could also do, if you remember, uh, with the censorship example I gave, impedes the writer's ability to whatever, remember? And so, so, but again, but it was consistent the way I did it. So that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And so that won't come up too often in your writing, right? But it will when it comes to your intro. And again, that's one of the things that we've been working on, right? So watch out for that too in your final paper. Okay, good, good, good. Now, here we go. Here we go with the was by, all that kind of stuff. This is something I used to do all the time. And so I think I think it's it's a simple thing to fix, but it's a good idea to 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 be aware of it. Okay. Let's take a look at a sentence. It's a very simple sentence, but then let's look at passive and then active. Okay. And I think you'll agree. You'll agree. The minute you see it, you'll see what I mean. The bill was approved by the board. So that's that construction. I used to do it all the time. Like, well, not all the time, but but you know what I mean. The was by, the was by, was by. Get rid of that. The bill was approved by the board. Instead, the bill, okay, I'm sorry, instead, the board approved the bill. Boom, goes the dynamite. So, if you remember back, remember we were talking about this idea, get the subject at the beginning of your sentence. It's what we started with today, right? 24 minutes ago. Get your subject at the beginning of the sentence. The board approved the bill. It's really interesting. If I was to actually give you a sentence like that, I won't. But let's just say I gave you a sentence, the bill was approved by the board, and asked you, underline the subject. You would be tempted to underline bill, thinking that's the subject, but it's not. It's actually the board that is the, su the subject, right? Because nothing can happen to the bill 
until we introduce the board. The board, the board has to do something to the bill, right? So now I think you, you begin to see why I'm saying how this can get really complicated. But as I said, let's go back to the page one of the lecture today. Get your subject at the beginning. Get them at the beginning, everything falls into place. It's simple, it really is simple. So two things so far then. We get rid of the ing words, gerunds, right, at the beginning of your sentences, okay, unless they are the subject. And then we get rid of the was by, okay, two. There's two things right there. So instead, get your subjects at the beginning, and then things become, well, more active to begin with, but much more clear, okay? Much more clear. The board approved the bill. Good. Then, in the practical, uh, Canadian practical stylus, they also talk about this idea of things they call stretchers, okay? And so, watch out for phrases like to be, okay? Okay. Yeah, I know, I know, Shakespeare. But he seems to be upset. Well, and why not just write he seems upset? Unless, of course, you need a couple of extra words for your word count. Right? <laughs> oh, I've only got 898. Okay, to be will work there and I get 900. Okay. And, and I, I think I mentioned this before with you. Don't worry about a word count. All right. Don't include that at the end. This isn't, we're not in Kansas anymore. Okay. Remember, remember that, that the, the phrase I, I, I gave you a long time ago, right? Anyway, all right. I alluded to a movie, okay. And then also use of. His use of dialogue is effective. Okay, well, why not just write his dialogue is effective? So again, little things, little things. But, but if you do want to get like just crisper in your writing, right? Then those are the kind of things you want to be aware of, okay? All right. Now, chapter 10. Okay. Normally we could have a lot of fun with this on, on, in class. Okay, but but uh, I think I'm just going to go through it. You know, I'll, I'll just explain the difference between denotation and connotation. It's not a big deal. Uh, you, as a matter of fact, you probably learned this in grade eight. I'm not kidding. All right. But I'll come back to something else that we did talk about. So denotation, okay, refers to the literal meaning of a word. Okay, the dictionary definition. So if you looked up uh, a word like snake, right, then you would discover the, uh, the denotative meaning simply, and you would actually give like a, a very dull, clear definition. Remember we talked about definition, what, lecture seven or eight? I can't remember now. Everything's blurring in together. But, um, but there's your example there. Now, connotation, on the other hand, let's say I called you a snake or you called me a snake. Well, then the connotative meaning would be the... Um, Basically, the associations, okay, that are connected to this, that word that, that you just called me or I called you. That That's the difference between the two, right? Yeah. And so, if you think then, the connotative meanings, and this is, I think this is worth elaborating, okay? The connotative meanings of word exist together with the denotative meanings. And so, basically, the connotations for the word snake could, could include evil. Okay, or danger in one culture, but something very different in another. So I think that that's important to understand when we're talking about a course in language, right? Like using utilizing words certain ways. You could have certain signs, and there's a whole there's a whole area of study called uh, semiotics which deals with all of this. Uh, I, I, I think I've got a quick example there. I usually do it on the board, but in semiotics, where a word in one culture may mean something very, may, may mean something very negative in one culture and be very positive in another. So that, that, that's where language and culture kind of, you know, come together. Well, language and culture always come together. But what I mean is how, how when we transgress between cultures, how meaning can change, right? And so, Denotation then, yeah, it might be this specific literal image or idea or word, whatever, right, that, that, that what we call a sign refers to, but the connotative would simply be the figurative cultural assumptions, okay, that that image applies or suggests or whatever, right? And so, yeah, the example I have in your notes here was I, I, I would usually draw it on a board. And just simply, and without any words, I would simply draw the sign of a stop sign. And right away, you kind of know what it means, right? Even though the word may not say stop, it may say something else, right? 
right? Or, any, or whatever, right? So anyway, and so the denotation then would be the literal sign, the, like the stop sign you're looking at, right? But the connotation might suggest risk, you know, accident uh, or ticket, right? If you, if you drive through that sign. And so anyway, I, I just thought that was worth mentioning, but maybe it wasn't. Okay. Now, another thing. When you're thinking about inclusive or non-sexist language, now it's interesting. I'm not trying to sound neoliberal here. I'm simply saying you never want to be using, again, I see this not too often anymore. We are getting better at this. But I do see individuals who they're trying to be non-sexist, right, or inclusive, and they'll write things like S slash H-E, okay? Or we fall into that, that terrible trap of he or she, he or she. You don't do that. And there's a really simple way of getting around that, right in the plural, right? Right in the plural, they. And so, and again, I understand all the, everything that's going on today with, with inclusivity and with language and, and with, um, well, to be honest, government policy. Don't email me. Yes, I'm aware of Jordan Peterson and all of that, okay? But it's it's very simple because it, it just makes for clumsy writing when you're doing the she, he, he, or she. Just write they, write in the plural. And it takes care of all of that. So again, remember, I'm not telling you you have to do these things. I'm saying to improve your writing, to clean things up, right? Be aware of stuff like that. That's all, okay? All right. Now, um, yeah, it's funny. I, I think it's, we're only going to go about 40 minutes today, but that, that's fine. That's fine. I know we've got other things to worry about. You're writing stuff and you've got other courses and everything else, right? Euphemism. I'm sure many of you know what a euphemism is. So uh, again, I don't have to go into that too much, but quite often a euphemism, the simplest way of describing euphemism would be something like um, you use softer language to tone down maybe a harsher aspect, okay? A harsher concept. And so, or, or maybe to avoid taboos, right? And so you want to be more polite. L let me give you, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to give you this example, but um, quite often in, in, in the way in which we deal with death, right? We don't actually say someone died, they passed away. That would be a good example of euph euphemism. So if you ever wonder, like, if, like, well, I don't think, I, I would never ask you this, but, but if you're ever wondering what euphemism means, that's more or less what it means, just soften, right? Just soften is the, is the best way. And so I've got a couple of examples for you here. I used to have a whole lot, but uh, layoff, downsize, okay, right size, head count adjustment. That's, that's one of my favorites, right? Like if you find out that your your company is going through a head count uh, adjustment, right? <laughs> that usually means a pink slip, right? We don't actually use pink slips anymore, I don't think, but literally it means you're being fired, okay? So a reduction in force, et cetera. Realignment, same thing. And of course, outsourcing, you're all aware of that, right? So anyway, I, I, again, the, if we were in class, we could have a lot of fun with that. I usually ask you guys, like, so throw some at me. And it's funny because because you are much younger than I am. Uh, you would have terms that I wouldn't even understand, right? Right? Like if I was to steal your phone and try and read through some of your texts or whatever, I wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. And so that, and so like euphemism, language, all these things, they, you know, they, they vary, they change. Okay. Yeah. Believe it or not. Yeah. We're almost done for the day. We've got about five minutes left. Vocabulary. I'm going to send you a file and I'm going to explain how I can improve your vocabulary. I'm not joking. I can improve your vocabulary in a day, in a day. Many of us, when we, especially if you're trying to learn a new language, when, um, when, we, when we are trying to figure out how to expand on our vocabulary, we are told, like I, this is what I was told when I was learning French, um, oh, just read, like just read newspapers, read whatever. No, that, that's a horrible way to, to try and learn a new language because newspapers especially don't follow the rules of grammar and you know, uh, expression the way that we've been trying to look at here. So how can we improve our vocabulary? Okay, let's just think for a moment. Believe it or not, there are over, um, they, in, in 2037, now, okay, I should take a couple of seconds just to explain what I mean by this. In 2037, the new Oxford English Dictionary will be published. 
Now, by that, I mean the actual hard cover that would sit on a desk, okay? And like obviously the Oxford English Dictionary is online, okay? But if, but if you wanted to get the new set, the new set will be coming out in, two, in 2037. That's how long it takes to put this, these types of things together. And if I was to show you, if you had a full set, the, the full set would probably be the length of this room, right? That's how many volumes. And the volumes themselves are, you know, they're, they're about this wide, okay? And they're about that high. And the set would come with a magnifying glass. That's how small the print is. So in that set, there will be over 1 million words. And obviously by the time 2037 comes around, right, there'll be far more. Now, again, don't email me if, sorry, I don't mean to keep saying don't email me. What I mean is I'm aware that if you actually look up how many words are in the English language, you will find a number and the number will probably say something like 176,000, okay? So and literally, like, like that is the number that you'll find, but that's incorrect. 176,000, that's how many root words there are in the English language. So let me give you a quick example. Run, okay, R-U-N, run. But then you have running, runner, okay? So, so in other words, you have the root word, run, but then you have all these other words. So if you add up all of those other words, yeah, it's over a million. And a lot of this is coming from science, medicine especially, but technology, right? Like we're getting, you're, you're seeing new words all the time, right? Um, I, I'm still amazed. I'll come across something and I'll look it up and, and think to myself, I didn't even know that was a word. As a matter of fact, here's, a, here's a, a good word that only came into usage about 20 years ago, firstly. Firstly. For the longest time, firstly was not an acceptable word. But then it, it became. And so in, in language, in, in dictionaries, uh, there are people who actually are paid to read or to you know, go through uh, algorithms or what have you to see what words are still being used and which words aren't. And so some words are included. There are actually words that are taken out of the dictionary, right, of the Oxford English Dictionary, if they simply are, if, if they become what we know as archaic, right? They're simply not used anymore. And so... Here's a selection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to give you a couple of quick examples. Um, new words that are now included in the Oxford English Dictionary. But as I said, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Okay. Okay. Actually, actually, let me let me give you an example right now. Last week, I was at the courthouse. Okay, here in 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 the city, uh, for reasons which are not important now. And uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting in court and I noticed that the, uh, the judge was disinterested. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So most people in class, when I, when I asked that question, they would say, well, that's a bad thing. No, actually, it's a good thing. Disinterested does not mean uninterested. So just knowing that D-I-S that's different from UN. Uninterested would mean not interested, right? Un means not. That's that. And so dis means to be apart or to be like, if we work it through, to be objective. So you want the judge to be disinterested. You want the judge to be objective. So it's interesting. I, I started page six by saying, I'm going to improve your vocabulary. Learn your prefixes and your suffixes, but prefixes especially. Those little phrases that come before, right, the actual root word, okay? So, interest, dis or un, knowing the difference between the two. Interest is the root word, dis or un would be the prefix. So, and I've sent you, I've sent you a, a really, really good example. There's, I found a file which lists all, you know, quite a few, the over, I think there's over a hundred. Um, and I, I could literally you know, do with you what I just did, but, um, but become aware of those things. And, you know, uni, uni, U-N-I, right? Unicycle, but unilateral. 
Okay, so unicycle, well, because we don't really think of the, the prefix, we all know what unicycle means, one, right? One, one wheel. But unilaterally, that would mean, say, a country got involved unilaterally in something. It means they went on their own. So a little thing like that, intra as opposed to inter, okay? Again, I sent you the file, you've got it, but not a bad idea. That's how you can really increase your vocabulary very quickly, very quickly, right? So anyway, um, so yeah, I included a couple from 2015, like new words in the language, many of which uh, I was, some of which I was surprised at. Um, bants, right? Uh, playfully teasing or mocking remarks exchanged in another person or group, like coming from banter, right? But brain fart, I was under the impression that word had been around or that phrase had been around for a long time. But in fact, it only came into the Oxford English Dictionary in 2015. And then you got a couple of others there, butt dial, obviously because of, you know, smartphones and, and what have you, right? And man spreading. I'm sure you're all aware of that phrase, right? Man spreading. I've given you the dictionary there. But one I would ask you to think about, all right? I'm not forcing anything on you, again, like a the whole idea of language, but MX as a noun. So rather than miss or misses, instead using the phrase MX. So a title used before a person's surname, okay? by those who wish to avoid specifying their gender, or by those who prefer not to identify themselves as male or female. And it's usually pronounced mix or mux, all right? But anyway, I just thought that would be a, a good one to add. Uh, and again, I'm nowhere near as liberal as it sounds when I'm talking about this stuff, but that's just common courtesy in my mind, all right? As a matter of fact, I looked up all this stuff on the um, LGBT2 uh, website. I'm, I'm trying to remember now which one exactly. Sorry, LGBTQT2. And um, and they said the same thing. They're, they're nowhere near as militant as, as you would think. They simply say, well, you know, refer to someone as they would like to be referred to. Simple as that. Right? Anyway. All right. I think that got, got that acronym a bit mixed up. Sorry about that. Um, you know, I sometimes get, I get confused. I'm an old man. All right. <laughs> anyway. And so, as I said, um, yeah, I figured 42, 43 minutes today. Um, think about these things then when it comes to your final essay, but in all of your writing, little things, all right? Little things, especially the was by, um, the to be, you know, the stretchers and all of that. Watch out for style, things like that, okay? So, um, as I said, because we're getting near the end of the course, I, th I think that's going to be good enough for the day. I figured 42, 43 minutes. And then what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to take a tiny break and then I'm going to actually do lecture 10. So I'll be wearing the same shirt and looking the same way. All right. Anyway. OK, that's good enough for the day. Thanks. Bye.